I'm just grateful to be here and super excited to um, actually finally have my first visit to Elsie. Um, since it's after lunch, I thought I'd start with a little light relief, um, which is that people often think I have Japanese ancestry because of my middle name, which is Imari. Um, but it's actually because my mother collected Amari dishes when I was a child, and she just thought the name was so beautiful that she actually gave me that name. Um, and so it's very nice to uh, finally visit the land of my middle name's ancestry. Um, so I am going to start today, um, actually I probably, hopefully most of my talk will be provocative. I don't think things are interesting unless they provoke you to think about things from a new perspective. Um, and most of what my group is trying to do is get at the physics of life, and we think that has something to do with causal and informational structure, so I'm going to talk about that a lot today. Um, and how I like to structure my thinking and also my talks is to start from the philosophy and the concepts um, and the big picture ideas. And so I think um, it would be safe to say that we have kind of a general concept of what we think life is, at least a work, set of working hypotheses in my group. And what we do is we try to find certain model systems that allow us to demonstrate simple aspects of that. And that's basically how I'm going to structure my talk. So I'm going to start with a really high level picture of what I think life is and how this ties to the themes of emergence um, and also communication in this section of this meeting and then try to connect that to specific examples to illustrate some of the concepts that might be relevant to thinking about that in terms of how we might actually get to a physics of life. And also just to be very clear on my own biases, I'm trained in theoretical physics and I think a lot like a physicist. So even though I believe in emergence, I'm really a reductionist, which means I like simple explanations for things. Um, and so I am very enthusiastic about the idea that there are simple laws of nature that will explain life. Um, and where I like to actually put those in sort of the hierarchy of theories is like we have general relativity and quantum mechanics, and there's some missing theory of information or something that would explain life, and it's at equivalent ontological status to those theories. All right, so what is life? <laughs> Um, so I would say the simplest way of talking about life or what the physics of life is, is to say that emergent properties, whatever we think emergent properties are, are actually causal. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you could talk about that. So maybe you want to replace emergent properties with macrostates. Or I would actually, the, the, the way I like to phrase it is more in terms of information or knowledge as actually being causal. Now, all of these words have different meanings to different people. So what I'll do in, in a couple minutes is try to just illustrate what I mean by example. Um, but I thought I'd start today doing something that I absolutely hate, <laughs> but I'm going to get out of the way early, <laughs> um, which is to talk about definitions. Um, and mostly, I actually, like, even when I look at what I wrote this morning, I cringe because I don't really, like, all of these things are, are terribly inaccurate to, to talk about what we actually mean. Um, but I know a lot of people in the room aren't physicists, so when we talk about microstate or macrostate or even a state or causation, it's very confusing. And a lot of people this week have asked me to explicitly explain what I mean by downward causation, because use, I've used that a lot in the literature that I've written. Um, so I kind of want to just explain a little bit about what these concepts are, because you might hear me use these words. And then we're going to forget about those definitions, and you can just go with whatever definition you want to use for those things. Um, but a state is basically just a description of a system. So Joe showed a lot of examples of states with like cellular automata, just a configuration of black and white cells. Um, microstate is when you have a lower level description where you know all the degrees of freedom and you can keep track of all of them. A macrostate is when you lose some of that knowledge and you just talk about things like temperature or pressure instead of the position and velocity of all of the particles. Um, and then causation is probably the most debatable definition up here, um, but I'm going to say as a working definition of causation, it's when one system intervenes on the state of another system. So notice I'm not saying a system can be causal to itself, it has to be causal to another system. Um, and then downward causation is basically when causal intervention is attributed to a macro variable, right? So can everyone in this room raise your hand? Okay, so that's an example of downward causation. I am the macro variable, and I just intervened on all your states. Okay, so that's basically what we mean when we're talking about downward causation. Now the debate in the literature on downward causation is whether that's fully explicable in terms of an atomic description or whether you actually have to go to the level of Sarah and everybody else in this room to actually explain that. And my argument would be there's no explanatory framework for what just happened if you just go to our atomic level. Why? Because there's actually macro variables involved in that, involved in that causal narrative. Um, and so I'm going to explain a little bit by example um, what that means and sort of hopefully that will be a little bit more illustrative because I think even at this point there's a lot of debates that we could have and I'm perfectly willing to have them. I love arguing about this stuff. It's really fun. 
Um, okay, so we've talked about a lot of emergent properties this week, and we started really early with like emergent properties in the early universe. Um, and so that galaxies were emergent structures by the interaction of many stars, right? So this is obviously an example of emergence. And so one question you have, well, Sarah, you're saying emergent properties are causal, but this is an emergent property, it's not causal. All right, so what I'd like to talk about is actually like how do we characterize emergence? And then when do those emergent properties become causal? Now we do something interesting as a species when we construct instruments, measuring devices, to look at objects like this. We construct theories to explain that, right? So we have theories of gravitation. I've uh, written Newton's law of gravitation. I could be equally put in, put in Einstein's theory of gravitation here. But we construct theories and we use them to predict properties of systems. So we can actually you know, run now gal galaxy formation models and try to understand these systems. And so we have this tendency to think that most of science is predictive because we build these theories to predict properties of the world. And that's what their explanatory power is. But there's something really interesting that happens um, when we construct theories. And this is what I think is more interesting. So the theories themselves are abstractions, right? They're mathematical representations of regularities that we see in the physical world. In the case of this example, it's a small compression in the sense that we've been talking about emergence and emergent properties, a compression of how we describe regularities that we associate with the laws of gravitation. Now the interesting thing about the laws of physics and why they are so powerful in our society is that as compressions that explain so many regularities about the world, they allow us to do things that would be physically impossible without that knowledge. And so my favorite example to use, which I use all the time, is our ability as a technological civilization to launch satellites into space. Right? We observe some properties in the world, emergent properties arising because of gravitation. We explain them with some law of gravitation. That's an informational compression of regularities in the world. And then we use our technology to actually do a physical process of launching satellites into space. And we become the only planet in our solar system that is going, undergoing a process of anti-accretion rather than accretion. Right? So we, we all talked about planetary accretion earlier. Now we get technological civilizations, we get anti-accretion. So to me, this is fundamentally the most distinctive attribute of the physics of life, is that we are actually capable as information processing systems, not just of extracting the regularities from the physical world around us, but using those to perform transformations that would be impossible otherwise. There is literally, I, I can't imagine a planet launching little boxes <laughs> of metal into space to monitor its behavior without technology having evolved on that planet. Um, and my argument would be that's actually a physically impossible process without knowledge or information. Um, and so this is what I mean when I say that information is causal. And what I mean as being the most distinctive properties of the physics of life. And so I think most of the challenge that we, we face as trying to understand what the underlying theory is is to build explanatory theory for this kind of thing. So we've been doing science for 400 years. Now we have to explain why scientists exist to be able to do science in the first place. Yay. OK. So just another example. I really like this one, too, because people are always now putting up these periodic tables. And this one doesn't have nuclear star uh, um, mergers. But um, you know, we can explain the origin of all of the elements in terms of all of these different physical processes, but there are some elements that require technology to synthesize them. So it's just another example of things that wouldn't exist without technology or information processing systems. And so I think a lot of people talk about these kind of things, but I think the most elegant um, description I've, I've still seen to date is one of my favorite quotes from David Deutsch. Um, which is that base metals can be transmuted into gold by stars and by intelligent beings who understand the processes that power stars and by nothing else in the universe. And so I think if we're talking about causation in sort of a rough sense, there's really two kinds of causes. There's the explanatory framework of the laws of physics and chemistry, the things that are the regularities in the world that exist, conservation principles, however you want to talk about it. And then there's these knowledge-bearing systems that learn about those regularities, and then they can not only mimic those processes, but they can control them. Um, and that's what I would say the living physics is, the domain of physics that life encompasses. Um, and so there's really, um, in my mind, two major domains of physics. There's sort of like the objective description of the world, the world as it is, and then there's the systems that understand that and actually can control that physics. 
So I worked a lot on the origins of life, um, and so one of the proposals was that the origin of life as a transition is actually a transition into this domain of physics. So you might think about it sort of like the quantum to classical transition in some sense, where you go from one domain of physics where information doesn't matter to a domain of physics where information really does matter. Um, and so one analogy I actually like to draw, because people think there's a hard boundary between non-life and life, and I think that's an arbitrary distinction to make, um, is that we talk about gravitation as being a universal principle or a universal law of nature, but when we study gravity, we go to look at planetary objects or we look at black holes. Um, I think life is sort of similar. Information or, or this concept of emergent properties or things, um, they exist outside of life, but where you want to actually go to study them as being most representative of that physics is to look at living entities. And so the origin life transition is when this kind of physics actually becomes dominant. Um, and so my argument has been, and will continue to be probably for the rest of my career just because it's more interesting, um, is to say that life is not physics as we know it because of this, these unique aspects of the informational causal structure of living matter. And that um, there really is a lot to be done to understand that. And a lot of people in this room are working very hard in developing measures for that and thinking about it in new ways. Um, and so I find that really exciting. So that's sort of like the background philosophy, and now I'm going to go into two explicit model systems that my group has been working with um, to just try to explain a couple aspects of that. And the first one I want to talk about is the ants, because everybody loves ants, they're so cute. Um, and these particular ants are temnothorax that are from a collaborator's lab, um, Stephen Pratt, um, in a project with Stephen Pratt's lab and also the lab of Ted Pavlik at, at ASU. Um, and so we talked a lot, um, especially Joe talked earlier, which is an excellent setup for this, about different information measures and how we might look at information processing um, as an emergent property of systems. And so what we're trying to do is actually explicitly measure this in an example of collective behavior. And the main point that I want to get at with this is, is this sort of one of the aspects of downward causation, which I think is really confusing to people, is they think there's a top level and a bottom level, and that top level intervenes on itself. But in reality, what the hierarchical structure of living systems is, is there's a lot of different macro variables that could potentially be um, influencing other aspects of other systems. And there's a sort of um, many level structure <laughs> of different macro variables interacting with other parts of the system. So for example, um, what I'm going to end up showing you with the ants is that they have different ways of actually um, transmitting information to each other, just like we do. You're listening to my language right now, but you could also be looking at you know, the motion of my body or something, and those are different channels of communication. There are different degrees of freedom. Nobody in this room is actually looking at my temperature right now, right? But if you were a predator, and that was a relevant variable to you, you might be measuring that part of my macro state, right? So the way biological systems operate is to interact only with certain degrees of freedom of other systems, and it's actually the hierarchy of those many levels of interacting parts that makes the structure of living systems, which is why they're complex and why they're difficult to describe and reduce. Um, but we can look at it with a really simple example. So people like to look at like flocks and other things and, and all kinds of different aspects of collective behavior in biological systems. But what if we just take two interacting entities, because it's nice and simple, and we can look at the structure in a really simple way. Um, and so um, the project that I'm going to describe has been led by um, a postdoc in our group that's also um, part of Ted and Steven's group. Um, Gabriel Valentini, and he's been looking at a particular behavior in ants um, called tandem running, um, where one ant actually leads another ant. Um, and they can do this behavior to try to teach another ant where a food source is or where a new house is. Um, and so what we see when we actually look at the ants exhibiting this behavior is that as a leader moves, the follower follows. Sometimes they're in physical contact, sometimes they're not. And there's an implicit assumption that the leader is somehow teaching the follower something. So there should be some transfer of information in their interaction. Um, and so trying to think about this in terms of information theory and the kind of things that Joe was talking about, um, there's a lot of ways that you can think about these ants transferring information, right? It could be pheromones. It could be actually direct physical contact. And what we ended up doing is trying to think about a leader ant, say, as a transmitter and a follower ant as the receiver, and what are the different ways that they might actually be communicating information. Um, and so some of the ones that we are looking at are motion. So for example, if I'm an ant, I might not be moving, or I might be moving. If I'm an ant, I could also be rotating, so I could decide to move this way. I could decide not to rotate, or I could decide to move this way. And so um, Joe was talking about how you actually partition the states of your system. That's a nice way of 
what we would call coarse graining the behavior. So I might be an ant walking around like this, and you have to describe my state of my system in terms of zeros and ones. There's different ways of doing it. So those are different coarse grain representations of the same dynamical system. And you might ask, which ones are communicating the most information? And how would I actually understand the information flow between the leader and follower? And I've drawn this in sort of the way that we would intuitively think, where the leader is transmitting information to the follower. But as we'll see, you could potentially have it be the other way around. Now, one thing that I have as a general philosophy about doing science, and I think this was brilliant about um, what gabri has been doing with this system, is that you should never look at one system in isolation. It's always good to have comparative systems, especially when you're talking about physics of life, because you don't want to generalize from one system. Um, so we actually ended up doing um, the um, information theory analysis I'm going to describe on ants and termites. And ants and termites are actually very different, um, but they, they exhibit the same collective behavior of having one entity follow another, but they do it for different reasons. So in ants, they're actually trying to lead someone to a potential site. In the termites, it's actually more of an exploratory behavior where they don't know they're, where they're, they're going, but they're trying to stay together to actually find something interesting. Um, and what we end up doing is taking videos, like this one that's shown on the left, and then tracking the leader and follower ant or termite over time um, and building some kind of trajectory. And then you have to discretize that trajectory in ter terms of some kind of macro variable. So the um, ant or termite might rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. And then you can actually track that over the time series and turn it into a sequence of states for the system. Um, and then I'm not going to get too much into the information measures because Joe did a beautiful job of, of um, covering those, but if you look at an ant, say, with high entropy in its state, it would be sort of equally likely to turn in any direction. If it has low entropy, it might prefer to turn left or right. Um, and what we actually want to, we're more interested in is a transfer of information between leader and follower. Um, so that's actually shown on the leftmost side, um, that we can actually look at the past states of an individual ant, um, and we can see how much more information is gained by looking at um, its what its um, state transition is going to be if we knew the state of, say, the other ant in the pair. Um, and this is a little difficult to see because of the colors, but um, one of the points here is that information flow could be from leader to follower or follower to leader. Um, and so we define something as the net transfer entropy in this case as being um, uh, subtracting the transfer entropy from the leader to the follower, um, or the follower to the leader from the leader to the follower. So it's a difference in the transfer entropies. And you can do that um, in many different ways. So Joe had these beautiful plots explaining what transfer entropy was with all the time series data. Um, and you may have noticed that one of the, the things that you can put in transfer entropy is the history length of the time series, so how much memory you're actually using from the time series to predict the next state. Um, and you can also, um, in this system, talk about how long you sample the data for. Um, so what's shown here is on the y-axis is the sampling period. So this is sort of the time scale of the trajectory, like how much of the trajectory we actually sampled. And on the x-axis is the history length. So you can think about that as memory. So this is actually a landscape of information um, in two dimensions of time. The actual time that you sampled the data versus the history that you actually used to inform your next state. Um, for the three different species we looked at, the ant species on the bottom and the two termite species are up above. Um, the color indicates the magnitude of the transfer entropy. So red indicates that dominant leader to follower. Blue is follower to leader. And um, just as a caveat, I didn't put the color bars up here, but these all don't have the same magnitude for the plots. But the main point here is that, as you would expect, if you look at any of these channels, motion, motion and rotation, or just rotation, the dominant direction of information transfer is primarily from leader to follower. But there's a, a rare case where in the ant, the motion, the follower is actually informing the leader in one particular macro variable, more than the other way around. And we can just look at that in terms of the net transfer entropy. Um, and so, I don't know. If you look at motion versus rotation versus motion and rotation, there is one case where the follower actually has a reverse direction of information flow. And so, in the context of this talk and thinking about physics of life, the main point to get across here is that when you're looking at complex living systems, 
it's not just information flows in one direction. It's never from bottom up, top down. It's in many directions, and it could be that two systems are communicating through one macro variable in one direction and another macro variable in another direction. And so I think one of the things that we have to start doing when we're talking about looking at structures of living entities is really understand the correlational structure between different degrees of freedom within the same system. And so one of the systems I was actually going to show a video of, but I decided not to just for the sake of time, that we're looking at now is in Mike Levin's lab with um, embryos, and Doug Moore that's here is actually working on this, is to look at different variables in biological systems and look at which ones are doing dominant information processing and which ones are actually informing other aspects of the system. So actually, how do you get at that more complex causal structure? Okay, so I'm going to move to another system for the last part of my talk. Um, which is to get at another point. So we're going to start talking about gene regulatory networks and criticality, as Joe alluded to before. Um, but thinking about emergent properties that arise due to life. And so one of the arguments I would make is that most of the properties that we associate with life are related to its informational and causal structure, right? Whatever those words mean, the rough approximations for what we actually mean. Um, and so we're going to talk about this specifically in the context of criticality. Um, and so Joe already did a really nice job of introducing this aspect of criticality, but people think criticality is important um, in biological systems because it kind of optimizes um, being adaptable, but not too robust um, that you can't um, vary at all. So you don't want to be too adaptable, but you don't want to be too stable. And so there's been this long-standing hypothesis that gene regulatory networks should be critical, which Joe introduced previously that had been proposed by Stuart Kaufman. Um, and so um, in order to get at that, people have constructed what are called Boolean models, um, as Joe described previously. And what they do is they actually take the expression data from genes as they occur in organisms and try to binarize it. Basically, like, is the gene expressed or not? That becomes a Boolean state. And then um, coarse grain the interactions of all of the components of the system into some kind of Boolean logic function. And so if you look at an individual gene, it would be explained in terms of a Boolean truth table as its state transitions, um, which would be another gene is expressed, it interacts with this gene, and it has a specific output of being expressed or not. And you can actually construct networks and explain the dynamical time series of expression patterns in real organisms with these kind of networks. And so um, this has been done with enough biological systems that there's actually databases of Boolean network models for gene regulatory networks. Um, but nobody's actually done a systematic analysis across these models. And so what we did was actually download uh, 67 models from the Cell Collective database and start trying to do a systematic analysis of what are the properties that um, are common across all of these different networks. And just as a caveat, I think this is really important for talking about physics of life also, because we tend to look at like a particular living system, and we want to say, like, this is alive or not. But I think life as an emergent property is a statistical property, and therefore you actually have to look at ensembles of systems and compare ensembles to infer differences about um, what the properties are that are unique to life. And so in this case, we're looking at an ensemble of biological regulatory networks and comparing um, as I'll show, to ensembles of random Boolean networks to try to figure out what are the properties unique to biologically functional networks. And so to do that, we actually had to construct random ensembles of networks. And so we start with these original models that we had from the Cell Collective database, and then we constructed a set of randomizations. And so you can randomize networks in a lot of ways, um, but the ways that we actually end up doing it, we're trying to, to be systematic. Um, so you can keep the same number of edges, and the same biases in the activity table, the, bi the Boolean functions. So you're basically preserving something about the Boolean functions over the network, so something about the logic, um, but randomized with respect to that. Um, and so, um, so overall, this would have the same number of interactions and the same structure of the logic at a global level for the network. Or you could do it where you preserve the causal structure, but you, you randomize something about the Boolean function. Um, and have a different ensemble. And then the last ensemble that we did actually preserves um, a particular property of the Boolean logic functions, which is whether they were canalizing nodes or not. And this was actually inspired by some work that Stu Kaufman had done, where he proposes that um, biological gene regulatory networks have something called canalizing functions as part of their architecture, where if you specify one of the inputs for a gene, you automatically specify what state that gene is in. So it's a, a certain structure 
of a Boolean function. And if you compare those ensembles, um, basically what we're saying is these become more biological because you're maintaining more and more constraints of the biological network. And if we look at um, a particular measure of criticality in these systems, so they're not actually the cascades that Joe was talking about earlier, but a more local measure of criticality, which is the sensitivity, um, you actually can compare whether um, the average sensitivity over the networks for each of these ensembles. And so the original biological networks are in red, and the different ensembles that are becoming increasingly biological, moving from gray to orange to red, are shown um, in the same colors that I described previously. And if you have an average sensitivity of one, thank you, the network is critical. Um, and these networks are actually chaotic. And so what we see is that actually the biological networks, as hypothesized by Stu Kaufman, are poised at criticality. But because we've constructed these random ensembles, um, we can show that that criticality isn't just emerging because of particular pro properties of um, the structure of these networks, but we can actually isolate what those properties are. And those properties are that the particular causal structure of the biological networks, and in particular that they have these canalizing nodes. Because once you introduce the canalizing nodes, you actually reproduce more of the critical behavior in the real networks than you do if you just control for the network topology and logic functions alone without introducing that extra constraint. And so basically what this shows is that if we look in the space of all possible Boolean networks, we might have networks that are critical. Um, and there were predictions about random Boolean networks that were the ones that Joe showed before um, that might have critical behavior. But they actually didn't, um, they don't reproduce the, the behavior that we see in the biological networks because you actually have to have this additional property of the canalizing nodes and a specific relation in the logic functions to their causal structure because of that. Um, and so the biological networks that we actually identify as being critical are explained in terms of their criticality because of this canalizing ability of these nodes, which is a, a specific relationship between the causal structure of individual nodes that I can intervene on it and produce a particular state um, that's associated with its logic. So there's a connection in, in, in talking about canalizing nodes between local logic and lo local causal structure. And that actually ends up being what explains the criticality in the real biological networks. Um, and so in this case, when we're talking about the criticality in real gene regulatory networks, we can't just talk about arbitrary random networks that are critical. They have to have these additional constraints in order to um, be consistent with what we see for real biological networks that are related with this local information and, and logic causal structure. Um, so I want to go back just for the last two minutes I have um, to this quote that I had at the beginning about these two domains of physics and just reiterate that I think, um, you know, I've demonstrated a couple examples that might try to articulate this point about how do we actually get at this physics and demonstrate it in simple models. But I think we have a long way to go before we can actually, you know, make predictive models about at the level we have for these kind of physical theories for what percentage of the universe actually organizes into these emergent properties we associate with life and, and what kind of percentage of the universe actually now gains enough knowledge to start transforming physics in the way that life as we know it has. Um, so with that, I'm just going to thank my research group. So many of them are here. Um, but um, Gabri is here that um, was responsible for um, the ant experiments and analysis. And these are our collaborators for that project. And then Brian Daniels and Stu Kaufman were also involved in the criticality work. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, we have time for some questions, maybe first from the audience. Anyone wants to start? Or we'll go to Slido. Uh, <laughs> so first question is, is the person in the room? So I'll read it. Anonymous. If uh, if downward causation <laughs> is just someone is afraid, I see. Uh, causation is just action of macrostate on another entity. Why use the word downward at all? Well, I don't use the word downward anymore because I find it conceptually confusing. Um, but I, I would just replace it with causal structure. And I would just say that biological systems have um, a much more complicated causal structure than other physical systems. Good. Um, another question from the room? Francis? Uh, I didn't really get what was so special about life 
being based on information and causation. Mm -hmm. I think about all systems are based on causation and on information. So what is it that makes life special? Right, that is right. So, um, so I think I think the key distinction is that it's compressing some regularities in the world to actually control the transformations. So you can talk about causation and information in physics, fine. I don't actually think the laws of physics are causal. Other people might think they're causal. Um, I think that's a subject of a debate. Um, but I think, again, that with these things, it depends on how you're defining those operations. And I would say that you couldn't explain a process like um, what a technological civilization is doing, for example, as an example of life with just the laws of physics and chemistry we have alone. I just don't think it's explanatory. It, it, it would be explanatory if you started doing things like fine-tuning the initial conditions of the universe, but I think that's a ridiculous ex explanation for why I'm standing here right now, is that that was somehow encoded in the initial state of the universe. I think there, it demands a different explanation. But that is a personal take on it, and you know, then that leads to a set of hypotheses that you might develop into your theories about how you might explain the world, and then you have to test them. So I think we're a long way off from that. Uh, but isn't compression of information a definition of cognition, and in which case your definition of life is the same as the definition of cognition? Sure, why not? This, uh, yeah, I guess the I like this first question, the top one better. <laughs> it actually kind of folds into, but I guess what what advantage does criticality confer? On biological, why, why are they critical? Why are that criticality? And could non-biological systems have an attractor criticality too? I guess that also folds into the question: this, Is this transition, this info causal phase transition of life, um, <laughs> is that a, a first order phase transition? Are there discontinuous changes in first order yeah. state variables? Okay, um, I was going to answer a tangential question with the first one, which is I think obviously criticality exists outside of life, but there's this interesting thing. Um, with our particular example where it's not entirely clear whether the criticality exists in, their, in those networks because of the particular structure of interventions we have to do in gene networks in order to infer their structure, that maybe the criticality just exists in our models. Um, but, but I think there is something um, interesting about life just exploiting the laws of physics generally. So if criticality is just a principle that exists in physics just like quantum mechanics is, like then you'll get people talking about like quantum biology, for example, but in my mind, well, biology exploits gravity, biology exploits chemistry, it exploits um, criticality. Anything that physically exists in principle is accessible to intelligent systems to actually use those laws to govern their own state, and I think that's all that biology is doing. So I think this is something that's really hard about understanding life is it doesn't violate any of the known laws of physics, but they don't explain it. Right, and so you have to you have to ask what are the additional explanatory principles for the second question. Um, I don't think that it's at all the case that you um, let's say um, you could look at a system and say this is not alive and this is life. I don't think it quite works that way because living structures it's it's not like life is a property of things. It, life is a um, kind of physics that operates across space and time in terms of how information constructs dynamical trajectories. Um, and that's not really um, exactly, um, it's not like I can point at this cell and say this one, like this chemical system is alive and this one's not. It's like they're part of a lineage and that, and I really like the way Michael Lachman describes lineages as being the units of life. I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it, that it's actually about that extended structure in space and time. So it's more like a higher order phase transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I make distinction between life and alive, actually. Like, for me, life is anything that requires information to construct it. So like this table would be an example of life, but alive things are the ones that are actually doing the constructing or the information processing. Um, and I think that helps me with clarifying sort of what are the structures that are actually doing these processes of building, you know, all these possibilities versus what is like the underlying physics of exploring new possibilities. I think Mark, you had a question. Um, on a kind of basic level, uh, what does uh, the research with the ants and the mm -hmm. termites tell us about emergence? I yeah. mean, uh, it's, well, I it's think, obviously I think something, point, right? Yeah, so the interesting thing there is, like, what I originally wanted to do when I was first talking um, with my colleagues at ASU about this project was do colony-level information dynamics, like what is the emergent computation at the colony level? But it turns out it's really hard to get that data. 
Um, and so I think one of the things that you can ask is, we don't really understand exactly how it is that ants as colonies can make collective decisions, but if we start understanding the component parts of how they transfer information, we might understand that collective behavior better. Um, and this gets some, into some interesting things about whether, whether information theory can distinguish different kinds of computation in different systems and how they're making different collective decisions, and I think that there are useful um, ways of thinking about how that can become a useful tool for understanding those kind of things, which Joe talked a lot about, too. Yeah. This is how it works. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that's the thing that, that makes emergence wonderful is it means that you have simple explanations at different scales. So I think people are, are really, it's interesting to me that, because people are like, oh, you can't be a physicist and believe in emergence, which is just ridiculous. But, but I like simple explanations of nature, and sometimes the simplest explanations are at what we would call an emergent description of reality just because it's not the most fundamental, like, you know, smallest scale of reality. But I think, um, I think the more remarkable thing is that we as inference systems can extract regularities about a lot of different scales of reality, and that's the physics that I actually want to understand is that, you know, how it is that we even do that, and then how we use that to construct things. So, so I think it's just, it, you can look at different slices of the physical world and describe them simply. And to me, that's interesting. Um, and that's why we can do science, so cool. <laughs> okay, one question from Takeshi. Yes, thank you very much. It was, it was a wonderful talk. Um, my question is, um, I like the, this uh, information called uh, or cause of structures of definition of life, but at the same time, you know, um, there is no like uh, one nanometer of life, or uh, there is no like a one, you know, one, I don't know, hundred kilometers of life. Or something yeah. Like. So, do you have any sort of um, what sort of physical chemical? Uh, Necessarily condition how, or for having this uh, informational or causal uh, structures that you think it's uh, it's related to with life. Yeah. So so I, I my my assumption is that we should be able to actually quantify how alive different physical systems are. So they should fall on a spectrum. But I don't think we know exactly what that spectrum is. My intuition is that really the quantifying criteria would be. How many path, like how many trajectories that one physical system instantiates? So, like a technological civilization to me is really alive because it can generate a lot of possibilities. It can do things like launch satellites into space. It has a lot of control over that. And if you think about the state of like the Earth system and how many configurations are possible with natural satellites versus artificial satellites, it's exponentially larger with artificial satellites. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the natural measure of what life is doing. So, the more information you have in a system, the more trajectories are possible. But that's really hard to get at. So, I think what we end up doing in practice is actually measuring the correlational structure of physical systems that generate those trajectories. Mm -hmm. And that's why like, I think the information theory is a useful tool because it's our best window, independent of which measure you pick, they're all different windows into the correlational structure of physical matter. And that, that is a way of understanding what the structure of those systems are. And once we understand that structure better, we might be able to formulate the physics better, but I don't think we know what that really looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's like baby steps along the way. Okay, so she didn't want. Yeah, yeah you go first. You go okay. First. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, I, I'm not sure whether we agree or disagree. I, I sometimes. I, I love some, those conversations. They're my favorite ones. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm confused about. Uh, you, 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 you seem to to define life uh, by technology, and I think that's a little bit. Um, well, it's not that I define life by technology. It's just I think that those are the most readily accessible examples to understanding and relating to people. That so I could equally talk about chemistry, or I could talk about um, you know use social insects or any other example of life. But I think technology is the one that everybody understands because we're embedded in technology and we're living in a technological age and we see how technology is transforming our everyday lives. So I like to use it as an explicit example of that physics. But it's not that. Um, so I guess maybe um, my, my philosophy is that whatever physics explains the origins of life is the same physics that's happening now. It's just happening at a different scale. And that is an assumption that you could disagree with. But I find, given that we have only one example of biochemistry on Earth, if we want to get at universal principles, um, 
the only hope that we have with that one example is to assume that those principles emerge across different scales and that there might be a unifying principle there. Yeah, I would like to, to ask the question. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. But I wanted then, to clarify the technology thing. because Yeah, right. Okay. okay, so okay. because I think that, that downward causation is something you find many places in physics that has nothing to do with life. If you have, a, sure. if you have convection, you mm -hmm. will... Um, anyway, so you, you know that. And, and I, I'm not sure... So, and you would be able to find um, um, so 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 downward con co downward co causation also exists in in non living mm -hmm. systems, um, and uh, it's true that you, I, you there was somebody yeah you you said that that uh, you're sort of wondering whether you would define life with cognition and I think that you could stretch the word of cognition cognition as being interacting with the environment mm -hmm. because that's what you need when you have a metabolism so right. so that's sort of a a, a very uh, then you have to sort of the fine grains of cognition is mm -hmm. once you start to interact in a uh, in uh, as living systems do so uh, anyway so I'm, I'm just a little bit I, I'm not sure exactly what you said <laughs> that's okay I, so 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 uh, um, yeah, anyways I guess we'll have to that is a longer story yeah, but, so but do I think you have that you question? Yeah, I do have. Yeah, I'm asking. I'm asking you. Yeah, I'm do. I'm. I'm. I'm trying to figure out what you mean. What What is characteristic about living systems of all these things you have said? Te technology well, is certainly one thing. But if you, you you talked about how can we find signatures of life, and I would, so think I would that, say that that you could you could you should look for for continents. People believe some people, anyways, believe that continents, sure. the formation of weathering of sure. of rocks. Is is uh, to a great extent done by by living systems. Okay. So 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 there is a, a number of, of other ways that you could you can look for signatures of life that doesn't need to be technology. No, I didn't say it had to be technology. Like I said, I think I already answered your question with that part. That I think technology is a useful example, but I don't think I don't think it needs to be technology. It's basically anything since the origin of life that has emerged on this planet is an example of life in the framework I'm adopting. But you know, you might think that's too broad, but I would just, you know, I would say who in their right mind, you know, 800 years ago would think that, like, me being stuck to the earth governs, like, you know, stars in the heavens. I, I think the unifying principles across many different phenomena are the ones that are most powerful. And I think with life, you know, we haven't explored that sufficiently in depth to really decide whether or not there are unifying principles for all of the complex systems we see that have a unified theory. And I agree that it's really difficult to understand the abstractions that I'm talking about because in the process of talking about them, they're being developed, right? So, um, so I don't think there's a clear answer there. But I would say the thing that is distinctive about life is the sequences of transformations and the things that are possible because of information staying in a system or knowledge being acquired by a system. And you don't see things like that in turbulence. Yes, there's downward causation, but that downward causation doesn't cause new transformations that aren't any colder than that physics and being fully predictable by that physics alone. Let's continue definitely this conversation yeah. afterwards. Uh, we'll have, well, first let's thank both our speakers and everyone Thanks. for their session. Thank you.